committee presently meeting. Um, and by that, I mean uh, the conference committee is <laughs> is discussing a document that hasn't been revealed yet. Um, so what we were hoping to do today, of course, is share the information that GFOA members and standing committee members um, shared, uh, uh, were able to experience on Tuesday of last week. Um, we'd love to, to share with you some observations, some both positive and some negative feedback um, that we received from uh, Washington participants in tax reform. And then also we'd like to share with you um, where we are today, right now, presently, as we have conference committee members discussing a bill that uh, has not yet been revealed, although there has been some discussion about um, there being a, a, an agreement. Um, and, and again, there's, there still seems to be some conflicting information on whether there is or is not an agreement. But either way, we are keeping our finger on the pulse of the discussion today. But, but thank you for being on the call today. It looks like we have 24 standing committee members on the call, um, expecting a few more. Um, thank you for being here today. But also, um, I wanted to also thank you for your enthusiasm as you took to the Hill at such a pivotal time in uh, the tax reform discussion. As you know, Tuesday, December 5th was the perfect time. Tax reform is the foundation of all discussions. Tax reform, uh, it, it, it has an impact and an effect on state and local government finance officers. And as we continue to have discussions about tax reform in Washington, many of those actors whom we talked with while we were here were asking what your opinion was. So we were just delighted to have you on the Hill, giving your opinion, providing anecdotes, and allowing for elected officials and, and, and members of the administration, um, as well as SROs, um, giving them an idea of what it is that uh, the tax reform will adversely either um, uh, indirectly or directly impact state and local government finances. Um, so your meetings at the Treasury, the Congressional Budget Office, the Municipal Securities uh, Rulemaking Board, and as constituents meeting with senators at such a critical time absolutely made waves. And so today um, we have a few speakers uh, I will be addressing um, the meeting that took place at the MSRB. Michael Bellarmino, Senior Policy Advisor and Corba staff, um, will be discussing the meeting that took place at the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, Susan Gaffney will be discussing the meeting that took place at the Treasury. And both uh, Michael Bellarmino and I will be discussing um, the takeaways from our Senate meetings on the Hill and also um, discussing where we stand right now with the current tax debate um, actually presently taking place with the conference committee. Um, so first, uh, really quickly wanted to touch upon the meeting at the MSRB. Um, there are about 20 uh, uh, standing committee members from Tim, from CEDCP, from DET, um, all going to uh, the MSRB, went to um, uh, the MSRB in Washington and met with the executive director of the MSRB, Lynette Kelly, and they had a very specific agenda. They wanted to talk about um, QCIPs, rather, um, and specifically talking about the amendment to Rule G34, which would require placement agents to obtain QCIPs. Um, Members communicated to uh, uh, Lynette Kelly that the proposed amendments would may or uh, may have an adverse impact on uh, uh, placements that are made between uh, state and local government entities. Um, at this point, Rule G34 has been transmitted to the SEC. Um, and uh, Lynette, of course, seemed very pleased that the issuer community chimed in on that. We are still waiting to hear back from the SEC um, uh, to see what further actions might take place as a result of G34, but certainly we are uh, remaining um, uh, in contact with them about that. Second, the group talked, of course, about market advisories. 
Um, they uh, discussed the market advisories and the potential indirect impact on the issuer community. Um, and the MSRB and Lynette Kelly expressed that they understood our frustration um, and the need for them to consult GFOA before issuing market advisories. But at the same time, they maintained that they believed it was their role to provide this kind of advisory and service for the market. Um, and they uh, uh, mentioned a few times that they would try to be more consistent about socializing issues before market advisories are distributed. Of course, as you know, uh, the GFOA um, participates in the industry roundtable that the MSRB hosts, and we will continue to uh, communicate that with Lynette, um, that the, if, if, if the goal is to socialize the issues, that we would love for the issuer community to be able to comment on the advisories before they're distributed. Um, that was the extent of the meeting at the MSRB, and at this point, would uh, like to turn it over to Michael Bellarmino, Senior Policy Advisor, the Federal Liaison Center, and staff of CORBA. Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> Thanks, Emily. Uh, so I'm going to just talk briefly about the meeting at the Congressional Budget Office. Um, as some of you, or for those of you who were not able to attend this meeting, uh, CBO, as we refer to them as in short, is one of the organizations along with the Joint Committee on Taxation who you'll more often hear about, especially when legislation is moving through Congress. Uh, the primary job of the CBO, which is why they're important to us, is under the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995, they are responsible for examining every or nearly every bill that moves through committee and potentially gets to the floor um, in the House or the Senate uh, to make sure that there are no uh, unfunded mandates that are included in the bill. Now, this is important, again, because of the fact that um, prior to the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act, um, there were many pieces of legislation that, whether intentional or not, included um, additional responsibilities uh, or mandates, as we call them, that state and local governments would have had to fulfill without receiving any sort of uh, funding or additional assistance to help accomplish uh, those responsibilities. And so, um, again, CBO plays a very important part in, you know, helping to flag some of those potential unfunded mandates, as well as reaching out to stakeholders, those who are going to be most impacted by those unfunded mandates, state and local governments, and, and just trying to get a better understanding of what that really means for them. So we had an opportunity to, to meet with them. Um, the, the one drawback to meeting with the CBO is you never know what bill uh, they would potentially be work, could be working on at any given time. Um, so they generally will start their work once a bill begins to move through committee. Uh, so a couple of things that they were able to cover with our members was one, of course, explain their role of who CBO is and what they do especially under the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. And then um, they actually sought some feedback, even though they are not primarily responsible for scoring uh, the tax reform bill. They wanted to have some feedback to have a better understanding uh, on the implementation side of what that means uh, for state and local governments. So we had members sharing some of the information and some of the concerns that we've been raising, of course, in Congress on the state and local tax deduction, as well as uh, the challenges that are going to that we will face, especially with the elimination of advance for funding and, and private activity bonds. So um, they will continue to see us as a resource, and so you know we have uh, monthly meetings with their staff where they pretty much talk about some of the bills that are either uh, about to be entered onto their docket or that they're currently looking at, and they will seek you know, input from us and our members, you all, to be able to provide to them what that means for the boots on the ground. So um, certainly was a helpful meeting, of course, to continue to demonstrate that we are a resource that we hope that they will use uh, now and in the future. So uh, that does it for my recap of CBO. So I'll turn it back over to Emily. Great. It looks like Susan Gaffney has joined us on the line. Susan? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I'm going to give an update on our meeting at the Department of the Treasury with John Cross. John is the Associate Tax Legislative Counsel in the Office of Tax Policy. 
Uh, what that really means is he's the guy uh, when it comes to muni rules. John has spent his entire career as a bond lawyer when he wasn't at Treasury and a short stint over the SEC. So needless to say, thankfully, he's very well versed in all of our issues, and, and we had a great discussion. Unfortunately, it was a bit of a small group, about seven of us, but it was allowed for a great back and forth uh, with John, uh, which uh, in a meeting that lasted over an hour. So we were very appreciative for that. Um, we uh, talked about three main issues, uh, tax reform, of course, uh, issue price rules that came out uh, last summer, and pending TEFR rules. On tax reform, uh, John didn't have much to say about what was going on in the Hill, but we had a good back and forth about what all this could mean to the market and, more importantly, what this could mean uh, from what Treasury may have to do in the new year. Uh, if uh, we see that Congress does move forward with uh, eliminating or diminishing private activity bonds or advanced refunding bonds um, uh, or tax credit bonds, uh, there will need to be some kind of transition rules that come out of Treasury. John would be leading that effort. So we talked about that. Again, since we don't know what we don't know, um, it was hard to talk specifics, but we did mention to John GFOA's strong efforts to preserve private activity bonds and advanced refundings and uh, the, the need for transition rules uh, so that there is a way for issuers to move forward next year with completing deals that may not be able to get done by December 31st, if indeed that is in the final legislation. Um, he did mention that the administration over the past year has been working on infrastructure. We know this, we've heard about this, and so um, while the tax bill seems to address and take away some options, uh, he believes that uh, there are efforts in infrastructure uh, policies to perhaps expand ways for state and local governments to build infrastructure. Now, uh, that's just as far above his pay grade and, and most others at Treasury to decide what may be happening uh, as a whole with infrastructure, but he seems to think that if that does come to fruition in 2018, that we may see some possibilities and some funding options uh, not currently available to state and local governments. Um, we also talked about the slugs window closing. The slugs window uh, closed on Friday. Um, that puts additional pressure on the feeding frenzy that right now is trying to get advanced refundings done before the end of the year. Uh, there is an IRS revenue proc out there that explains how you can buy treasuries in the open market when the slugs window is closed. But again, it's just another hassle that's going on. That is not John's division, but he's certainly aware of that and did mention that. We then went and spoke about uh, the issue price regs, which were final and came uh, effective in June. GFOA and many of our members expressed concerns with seeing um, increase in costs associated with the market practices that have come about since the new rule, especially with the hold the price provision. And while a lot of this is anecdotal at this time, it's only been six months. And until recently, it's been a, a relatively uh, quiet market. Um, that is something that I know is very important to GFOA, and our members expressed those concerns to John. He was very interested in hearing that and really wants to continue that dialogue with GFOA to understand how the issue prices uh, rules are working uh, in practical ways, uh, both for large and small issuers. Uh, we also expressed some confusion for the competitive sell exception and how there really needs, to, we would appreciate some guidance on that, and also how to meet the actual 10% or 10 percent of actual sales threshold. John said it was unlikely, just in general, that there would be any further rulemaking coming out of Treasury, uh, but he did want to continue this conversation, and he'd be interested in knowing about these outstanding issues and trying to figure out a way to get some answers out to the market. Finally, we talked about TEFR rules. Uh, saving the most exciting for last. Um, the Treasury has proposed changes to the TEFR rules that are due at the end of this month. These are pretty much the same rules that were propo proposed in 2008. John did not, uh, he gave a bit of an explanation about the rules, nothing really controversial in there. Uh, positives that GFOA sees, especially per the comments that GFOA provided to Treasury in 2008, are that uh, these rules would allow for electronic posting of TEFR hearing notices. Currently, uh, you have to publish them in a newspaper or otherwise disseminate those to the public. 
but posting on the website would be a nice step forward. They're also looking for other ideas on how to uh, electronically disseminate that information. Uh, they're holding the 14-day notice period as is. Uh, and the requirement to hold a hearing, even if there are no, no one who wishes to speak. We talked a little bit about some clarification that may be needed about the timing between the authorization and the issuance. The proposed rules allow, uh, provide for the issuance must take place, the first uh, round of bonds must take place within one year after the authorization, and then all the bonds have to be issued three years after that. So there was some discussion about whether that needs to be further clarified. Um, of course, if there are no private activity bonds, there's no need for TEFR rules, so that was sort of the joke in the room. So we'll have to wait and see what happens uh, with that. But he's very interested in continuing the dialogue with GFOA on this. Many other issues, John did mention that uh, we all should be happy there are, that the political subdivision regs were pulled, so those won't be coming. GFOA and Emily have spoken out on that often, so that's one big positive. And John just, just generally expressed his appreciation and support for GFOA and uh, wants to continue the dialogue with Emily and her staff. So with that, I'll hand it back. Terrific, thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you also for setting the stage for our, our discussions that we had on the Hill, that is sort of framing uh, the conversations that we had with members, um, both direct member meetings with senators and their staff. And specifically, um, again, just to reiterate from the beginning of the call, the timing was critical to head up to the Hill. And um, we heard several member offices actually say that. And what's most important, and I think the most uh, impactful thing that came out as a result was that we had a constituent sitting in the room describing and telling the story of each of these uh, tax provisions and their impact on jurisdictions in their state. Um, specifically, we met with uh, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, Kansas Senator Pat Roberts, Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy, and Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Um, we also met with staff from House Speaker Paul Ryan's office, Nebraska Senator Deborah Fisher's office, and Missouri Senator Roy Blunt's office, in addition to several others. I believe we met with several Ohio senators um, and, and others who actually sit on the conference committee. So in effect, we were able to canvas and speak with the staff or the direct member of members who are sitting around a table right now discussing um, the final tax plan. And so again, it was, it was, I, it was ideal to have us uh, uh, do that, and it's something that we hope to replicate um, in uh, future winter meetings. But quickly, what I wanted to do is uh, discuss some of the um, responses that we received from Senate offices. And then I'll turn it over to Mike Bellarino, and he will discuss sort of the implications of how that got us to today, right now, and where we stand with the current tax reform effort. So, so as you know, we were, um, uh, standing committee members were armed with information about the provisions uh, that GFOA has particular, um, particular interest in, that is the uh, provision that would repeal the advance refunding of municipal bonds the provision that would repeal private activity bonds, um, the provision that would repeal the deductibility for individuals of their state and local taxes. And we also discussed um, uh, UBIT. Now, UBIT came up less often in the Senate meetings. As, as we discussed, we had about 10 seconds with the Senator, some longer, um, <laughs> some shorter. Um, and uh, we um, were particularly impressed <laughs> uh, when we did have 10 seconds, how members were able to communicate specifically what's important. Um, but, but first, uh, the first provision and some positive and negative takeaways that uh, wanted to relay to standing committee members but first, with advanced refunding, um, many of the Senate offices um, had said, as, as, as I mentioned, that we were doing the right thing at the right time. That's a really positive response that you can get from a Senate office, um, in particular because you know you're not shuffled in and shuffled out. You're not waiting in a long line of other special interests. Instead, 
um, we happened to be there at a quiet time, um, a time that was a very pivotal time, and uh, several member offices acknowledged that. But second, and importantly, what we heard from several member offices was that it was a reasonable request. That is, the one-year delay that we mentioned um, and some, uh, some offices apparently had talked about grandfathering in municipal bonds that had been structured prior to basic understanding of what the, the tax reform bill would contain. Um, both, of those, uh, both of those suggestions for revisions from several offices, including Senator Roberts, including Senator Cassidy, including Senator Portman, had acknowledged that the, the request that we made was a reasonable one. Um, probably the most uh, impactful meeting on advanced refunding was with Senator Roberts from Kansas. Um, we had the opportunity to sit with Senator Roberts for about 30 minutes, um, talk specifically through the projects that were in um, Kansas, and a standing committee member, uh, Brian Kidney from Lawrence, Kansas, um, was able to discuss specific projects um, that were put at risk because of this provision. And I do recall this very clearly, Senator Roberts looking through the list of projects um, that would be, that could have the potential to be impacted, or at least um, those advanced refundings that were done over the past five years. And he looked at a staff member and he says, we've got to do something about this. And that was an especially good takeaway because at that point in time, we knew that Senator Roberts had, had officially spoken with a constituent to say that he is committed to um, preserving that. Now, the, the bad news is that Senator Roberts is not on the conference committee. He is not sitting around the table right now. But since our meeting, we have kept up constant communication with Senator Roberts' office, Senator Scott's office, Senator Portman's office, who are also on the um, conference committee, um, and we have given them legislative language that would delay implementation of the advanced refunding provision for 12 months, and we've also given them legislative language that would grandfather in uh, municipal bonds that have been issued and structured prior to um, uh, December 31st, 2017. Um, Another negative is that we don't have a commitment. We haven't heard from one senator on the, stand, on the conference committee that they had pledged their support to offer that amendment. Um, at this point, and Michael, when Mike Bellamino will talk about this a little bit more, um, it has to do with the rates and not about how they get to it. And so we are, we're grasping for any bit of, of information specifically about advanced refunding that we can share with you, and we will share with you um, uh, once we receive that. Also, private activity bonds. Um, positive thing about private activity bonds that we heard from the Hill on Tuesday were that, you know, obviously they're slightly alive. In the Senate, they're very much alive. The Senate Interestingly enough, also um, in our, our, our meetings, um, again, several face-to-face -face meetings with um, senators revealed that, you know, they had taken President Trump's suggestion about sort of a 20% corporate rate not to be a hard and fast 20% corporate rate. That is, there's some flexibility in that. And by offering flexibility in the corporate rate also means flexibility in the pay fors so um, what that may mean, and we shall see here very soon, is that private activity bonds uh, remain alive because the Senate, uh, by virtue of understanding that there's flexibility in that 20% rate, may have the upper hand in the discussion. Um, Brady, however, uh, Congressman Brady, uh, does remain insistent about shaving down pads, that is only using private activity bonds for quote unquote infrastructure. And uh, we have a hard time understanding what uh, the definition of uh, the chairman's um, uh, definition of infrastructure is. But nevertheless, we have many private activity bond uh, advocates on the conference committee. Senator Toomey out of Pennsylvania, Senator Cornyn out of Texas, Senator Scott out of South Carolina, even Senator Portman out of Ohio have all um, at, at, at some point in time, if not during our discussions on the Hill, have said that they um, support affordable housing, they support airports, they support private activity bonds used for nonprofit hospitals. 
Um, and so we do continue to maintain uh, constant communication with them, but heard more positive things from the Senate um, on Tuesday of last week um, than, than we, we thought we would, <laughs> frankly. So last but not least, I wanted to really quickly touch on uh, SALT, the major pay for, for comprehensive tax reform. The state and local deductibility in both proposals was originally completely eliminated. Now, as it stands, it's a $10,000 property cap on the House version. And as we understand some discussion about matching that cap in the Senate version, actually what passed the Senate was matching um, that $10,000 cap that's in HR1. Um, SALT has been good news. SALT has been saved from complete elimination, um, but also neutral news. Um, we are still hearing different uh, derivations of what may be protected and what may be eliminated. Um, a very, very helpful meeting we had on Tuesday were a couple of the Wisconsin delegation that were able to stay behind and speak with um, the state and local government liaison and the speakers in the uh, Speaker of the House's office, Paul Ryan. And they were able to communicate that income tax is a large part of state and local revenue um, and uh, were able to communicate specifically the impacts to their delegations in Wisconsin or their, or, I'm sorry, their jurisdictions in Wisconsin. So that was a, an extremely uh, fortuitous meeting at that time. Um, again, we will remain alert um, as to any information that we hear. Um, about the final tax bill. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Michael Bellarmino, who will discuss where we are right now at this point in time. All right, thanks, Emily. And I know we're, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'll be brief so we can land this plane on time. Uh, where we are right now, of course, the conference committee had its first official uh, public meeting today, even though we know that uh, much of the negotiation has already been ongoing um, since they named the conferees last week. Um, as far as we know at this point, uh, at least based on the reports that we're getting, we likely will not see any text of the bill until after the markets close on Friday. Um, there, of course, uh, we're also hearing today that leadership at least has reached some sort of compromise as far as what they're hoping to work with in the conference committee. Um, as Emily mentioned, we're, we're hearing some mixed reviews that it's either they have reached some agreement or they're getting very close. Now, what that means, um, we don't know, of course, uh, until we see the details. What we do know of the, the compromise agreement is that there's likely going to be a slight uptick in the corporate rate to 21%, um, and there will likely be a, um, a decrease in the top individual tax rate to about 37%. But how they're going to get there and what are the tweaks that are going to be made in other areas, we don't know. Specifically, we don't know um, how PABs are going to fare at the end of the day or the advance for funding if we're going to hopefully see some sort of transition release. And as far as SALT goes, you know, that's still something that we don't know ultimately what the number will be capped at and if it will be an either or situation or just a cap that goes across the board for state or for property income and sales taxes. So. The good news is, of course, um, one of the things that we have heard or learned recently is that Representative Graves out of Missouri um, actually has led a letter on private activity bonds, and I think he was joined by about 28 Republican members uh, in the House. So again, that's really positive and, and you know, really a, a signal that, you know, messages from groups like GFOA is really being heard on such a critical uh, financing mechanism for infrastructure, and of course, if they ever do get through the tax bill, infrastructure is supposed to be next. So um, certainly think that the message is, is, is really uh, resonating. Now, um, of course, you know, we, you, you all should have received the alert that went out uh, yesterday or the day before on um, the conference committee. So we absolutely encourage you to continue to reach out if you have not already, um, as they really, you know, dive headlong into, uh, into their negotiations. But the bottom line, you know, at the end of the day, until we see the bill text, you know, we're still, uh, PABs are still highly at risk. Again, we're encouraged by the letter, but we want to make sure that that message is still continuing to be heard on, on the Hill. Um, as far as the advanced re refunding, we're, it's, we're in a wait and see mode to see if there is at least going to be that year transition. And hopefully the feedback that we got on the Hill that it was a reasonable request 
um, is something that we'll see come to fruition. Now, of course, after all this, because of the potential to trigger additional deficits, uh, the PAYGO statute will come into play, which they'll likely have to try to act on uh, after. Um, so, of course, we as uh, public issuers will certainly could still see some implications uh, because then, you know, the bond subsidy payments like your Build America bonds are certainly it could still be at risk depending on what they decide to do with that. So, uh, with that, I'll throw it back over to Emily. Great. Thank you all uh, for joining the call today. Um, again, if conference committee is meeting today, reach out to your senators, uh, remind them uh, about how uh, 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 advanced responding and private activity bonds are used in your local community. Tell your story, call them, leave a message. Um, we have heard that uh, the bill text will not be released until Friday. We have heard <laughs> that the bill text will not be released specifically until Friday after the markets close just FYI. Um, and then also uh, just again, want to thank you, thank you, thank you for your enthusiasm on the Hill, for your enthusiasm throughout the different uh, Washington offices. This feedback is invaluable, um, I think, both for uh, understanding it for your jurisdiction, but, but for our ability to share it with the rest of the GFOA membership, the 19,000 members. Um, out there. Um, thank you again for your enthusiasm. We look forward to updating you here in the near future as we do hear what comes out of the conference committee. Um, and please, if you have any questions about what we talked about today, please feel free to reach out to Mike or I. We're both on gfoa.org, our contact information. Um, and we look forward to uh, keeping you up to date on all things current in Washington, D.C. Appreciate you joining with us today. Have a great afternoon and happy holidays, everyone.